very appropriate that Bernadette introduced me because it was actually Bernadette who got me onto doing this as my PhD in the first place when she read um, an article some time ago by a chap called Nicholas White who wasn't an astrologer but he was an historian of science who did his MPhil on an interesting manuscript that had a horoscope in it that he thought um, belonged to Eleanor of Aquitaine. In fact, I, I'm pretty sure it wasn't that. But it did lead us on to say, well, this chap's interesting because he was, um, this Roger of Hereford guy, um, wrote the, probably, the first, uh, England's first astrology book. So it's a, a worthy topic to look at. But what I'm really doing my PhD in is, although I'm focusing on Roger of Hereford, I'm looking at how astrology got transformed in the 12th century with all these ideas coming in from uh, the Islamic and Jewish world uh, into Christianized Europe. So just to put things in context, there's a common perception really that, uh, that we learn at history in history at school that you had the Roman Empire, which everyone's heard of, and uh, they gave us, you know, what the Romans ever done for us, well, they gave us roads and aqueducts and this, that and the other. And then there was a kind of millennium of darkness, the Dark Ages, until the Renaissance came and we all became civilised again. And it's, in a way, it's still taught like that. It's not quite as bad as it used to be when I was at school in the 60s. But um, a few years ago, they have, they have actually updated this in the last couple of years, which is great. But um, the Key Stage 2 guidance for teachers um, talks about, gives one paragraph about the Middle Ages and calls the first part of the Middle Ages the Dark Ages. And the primary school curriculum talks about Romans, Anglo-Saxons and Vikings, and then jumps to the Tudors. Uh, so, as I say, they have been revised recently, <laughs> but uh, that's all it mentions. So, of course, if you live in England, there is one thing that happened in this so-called Dark Ages that you can't really ignore, and that was uh, the Battle of Hastings in 1066. We know that something happened in 1066, and English school children are, are taught about that. But that's more or less it. Uh, you'll find that actually 1066 and all that does play a part in our story as well. So just to give some background to this, it's true that um, science was on the decline in the, uh, the Western Roman Empire, if you like, you know, England, what's now England, France, Germany and so on. Um, Christianity didn't really approve of astrological divination. Uh, Nick has given a quote in his book saying Christianity allows little, little space for the horoscopic arts. Uh, there were a few classical texts, pagan texts if you like, that were known. Um, Pliny, uh, some of Timaeus, uh, the Venerable Bede of course, uh, was quite a famous character um, up in uh, Lindisfarne who was doing work on the calendars. Um, but most Greek texts have been lost, most of the classical astrological texts have been lost. So science was at a low ebb. Um, there's a, a book on the, the history of uh, 12th century science by Grant, and then his, his quote is, science was truly at a low ebb then. Now, there is, uh, there is one thing, though, that was necessary that is a bit astrology-like, or at least a little bit planetary-like, um, and that's to do with the calculation of Easter. Easter is, um, uh, to, to calculate Easter, I mean, it, it comes to, the word Pascalia comes from the Greek Pascha. And the reason that it's called Pascha in most European languages is it actually comes from the Hebrew uh, term Pesach, which is uh, Passover. And the Jewish calendar is a solar lunar one. So you have spring is always, uh, spring, summer and autumn and so on are always the same time of the, the year, so when we're uh, round about the spring equinox, it's, it's spring in the Jewish calendar, unlike, say, the Muslim calendar, uh, the Islamic calendar, where um, it's purely lunar and doesn't depend on seasons. The Jewish calendar does depend on seasons, but the start of each month um, is when you see the tiniest sliver of the crescent moon, and that's the uh, Rosh Chodesh, the, the, beginning of the uh, beginning of the month. And so whenever it's the 15th of a Jewish month, um, that's when it's a full moon and months have either 29 or 30 days and because that's not going to uh, divide equal, uh, nicely into 365 um, you have uh, leap, what they call leap years which isn't the same as our leap years it's a, a, a year that has an extra um, a, an extra month a 13th month just to bring everything back into line again now 
the Gospels say that Jesus was uh, crucified on the eve of Passover, which would have been, meant it was the 14th day of the first month of spring, uh, which is uh, called Nisan in the Jewish calendar. So the early Christians got a bit um, sort of exercised about when they should commemorate um, Easter. The early Christians, a lot of them celebrated it on the 14th of Nisan using the Jewish calendar. But then others said, well, no, you shouldn't be um, commemorating the crucifixion. Christianity is all about Christ rising again. And therefore, you should celebrate the resurrection, uh, which happened on a Sunday. Um, so therefore, we need to have a date that's always going to be a Sunday. So there was a big argument about this with some uh, celebrating Easter on 14th of Nisan and some celebrating it on uh, on the first Sunday of spring, after the first full moon of spring. And what the rule, uh, so, but sometimes, of course, that rule might be that the, the first full moon uh, might ha happen to be the 14th of Nissan. So there was this huge argument about whether you could celebrate it on the 14th of Nissan or whether you couldn't celebrate it then and had to celebrate it on a different day. Now, uh, it was finally decided by the Council of Nicaea 325, in the year 325 uh, the formula for Easter, which is basically the first full moon, uh, sorry, the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. It was a complicated thing, though, because not everybody knew how to, there were different ways of calculating the equinox, and people came up with different dates of it. And of course, Christians need 40 days notice of Easter. You can't just look out of the, sky, uh, the window and see that it's a full moon and say it must be Easter. You need 40 days notice of Easter so that you can commemorate Lent, the period of fasting before Easter. So a lot of time was spent in getting the calculation right, and it's not trivial because there are different ways of synchronizing solar and lunar cycles. And this whole field of computing Easter called computus um, arose. Uh, the Venerable Bede was very, uh, very much involved in, in doing this, and he wrote tables uh, of Easter that went up to, I think about the year 1000, something like that. Uh, might have been a little bit later. So by the 10th, 11th uh, centuries, they were getting quite keen on making sure that we knew how to carry on calculating Easter. So it's an important part of Christianity. So we do have Christians then who are at least interested in the technical details of astronomy. So we've got uh, just a few players there. Uh, is there a laser on this? Yes, yes the red button. Ah, oh, the red button. So we've got the Venerable Bede up there, who's writing his, uh, he wrote a book called On the Reckoning of Time, all about calendars and how to synchronise them. We have um, Alcuin of uh, York in the middle. He was around about the year 800, and he ended up uh, writing a lot of texts on, um, cal uh, on computers. And he, end he came to the attention of Charlemagne over there, and Alcuin of York actually ended up uh, staying in Charlemagne's court and working there. And he was complaining that the books in Germany weren't very good, and the Frankish kingdom weren't very good, and he kept sending back to York for his, his books. And then a couple of centuries later, we have um, Pope Sylvester. Oops. Pope Sylvester in the year 1000, who was, uh, actually was an astrologer and studied astrology. So this rudimentary astrology... Um, wasn't on the level it was during Hellenistic and Roman times. So what happens? Well, really, the missing part of our, uh, of our jigsaw in the Dark Ages myth is the rise of Islam. This is one thing that, uh, you know, this idea that nothing happened between the Roman Empire collapsing and the Renaissance. Uh, there was the rise of Islam, which was absolutely huge. And it meant that we have uh, all sorts of migration routes going on. We have, uh, at the end of the Classical period, Astrology moves east. The Emperor Justinian in the year 529 um, effectively banishes philosophers and astrologers. Uh, a lot of them uh, found that it was not a good environment to work in, and they moved east into Jundishapur in Persia, to the uh, court of King Croesus. And then the rise of Islam happened after that, and a, a lot of these philosoph uh, philosophers were, work were now working in an Islamic milieu, uh, and they were quite comfortable doing that, and moved to the new city state of. Um, uh, of Baghdad, in which was founded in 765. Islam spread all over um, North Africa 
and then up into Spain by the 8th century. So you have all these astrological ideas that came from the Greeks, uh, well, came from the classical world, not just Greece, they came from India and Persia as well, spreading across um, the Arab world and up into Islamic Spain. And from Islamic Spain, we also have roots coming in to, um, into England. We, or, uh, we already saw that we had relationships between York and uh, Aachen, which is on the what is now the French-German border with Charlemagne's court. And there seems to have been quite a few um, things early on where uh, Charlemagne, for example, went down to Islamic Spain and was presented with a water clock by one of the caliphs. So... Um, we do have these, this transmission route coming up through Spain and through the Pyrenees and, uh, and into France and even into England quite early on. But 1066 uh, accelerated that process because up until that point, um, Britain was monocultural. It only had, uh, it only had Christians, in effect. But uh, there were Jews living in, uh, in Islamic Spain and in France and... When William invaded in 1066, uh, he invited, or possibly ordered, according to Huscro uh, Huscroft, Jews into England. So you now suddenly have uh, people with a different faith living in England. And the Jews coming into England would have been working, in many cases, in this Islamic milieu. They would have been uh, familiar with Hebrew and Arabic, and they would have been familiar with some of the Arabic science as well. So they were bringing new ideas um, into, into England, and some of those were new astrological ideas. So um, we have these great centres of learning in the Arabic world, and then, of course, after 1066, a few decades later, you have the beginnings of the Crusades, and that uh, accelerates, as well as being a war, it also accelerates um, trade. So you suddenly find crusaders going to uh, the Holy Land and coming across all sorts of different cultures, all sorts of different uh, ideas happening. And you also have in 1085, Toledo, which is in Spain, um, falls to the Christians. It had been an Arabic centre of learning, so there were lots of Arabic texts there, and suddenly it becomes Christian. And so Christian scholars have access to all these Arabic texts. And you have this large movement of people going from Europe and England in particular, going down to Toledo, <coughs> learning Arabic, and coming across all these new texts that they've never come across before. So they'll come across things like Ptolemy's Almagest, uh, his astronomical work. Um, uh, and there are translations of all sorts of, of Arabic astrological texts happening round about this time. So... The idea of... Uh, Brits going to Spain on package deal holidays isn't new because they were doing it in the 12th century as well. <laughs> and they were going to Toledo, which, uh, as I say, was one of the great centres of learning. It wasn't just Toledo. You have people in the um, 12th century, like, um, late 11th century, like um, Adelard of Bath, goes to Syria um, and learns Arabic and translates texts. Uh, so it wasn't everything coming through Spain, but there was an awful lot of stuff coming through Spain. And... The key players, uh, the, the texts that were being translated, uh, were, uh, you had uh, people like uh, Adelard of Bath, Gerard of Cremona. Ibn Ezra was a, a Jewish rabbi and scholar and astrologer who um, wrote an astrology book, uh, well, wrote various astrological works. Um, so you have mixtures here. You have uh, Jewish scholars like Abraham ben Heer. Uh, he was earlier than that but Daniel of Morley, Herman of Corinthia, Robert of Chester, and so on, and the hero of our story, Roger of Hereford. Now, most of these people were working in Toledo in this uh, Islamic milieu, if you like. I mean, they were, they were uh, Christians and Jews rather than Arabs, but they were translating um, Arabic texts. Roger seems to be the odd one out, because we don't know if he actually went to Toledo or not, or if he just stayed, spent all his life in Hereford. I have found references that claim that he did go to Toledo for a couple of years and learn Arabic, and I'm still trying to track that down. That was in um, a book about Hereford Cathedral, and I've tracked down the author and who's put me in touch with somebody else, who's put me in touch with somebody else, so I'm still trying to track that down, because that would be quite, quite interesting. And 
The reason that I'm mentioning Hereford is before the universities, about a century before the universities, we had all this, the, these centres of knowledge tended to be in monastic schools. And monasteries were associated with cathedrals usually, so you would have a cathedral school or a monastic school, and there was certainly one at Hereford, that's a modern day picture of Hereford Cathedral. There would have been a monastic school there as well, and people were taught um, science, astrology, um, astronomy, mathematics and so on in these schools. Hereford Cathedral Library itself is quite famous because it's actually got a chained library, but they're all religious texts in the, chain, in the cathedral, which is not surprising. Um, but we know that a lot of the secular subjects, like astronomy and astrology and so on, were taught in the monastic schools of places like Exeter, Ramsey Abbey, um, Hereford. And so Hereford was a great centre of scientific learning. There seems to be a concentration of it. But none of them actually survive in Hereford Cathedral itself. So it's almost as though the school and the church were seen as having very different roles. Um, and of course, because Henry VIII uh, abolished the monasteries and smashed them up, uh, a lot of the texts that would have been in monasteries got dispersed all over the place. But we can still track them down because what we do have are medieval library catalogues that say what were in each of these um, monasteries. So we are able to actually track the provenance of some of the manuscripts and so on. <coughs> Anyway, we do know that somebody called Roger, uh, sometimes known as Roger Infants, and often known as just uh, Rogerus Herefordensis, Roger of Hereford, wrote a book on astrology called uh, De Astronomicae Judicandi, Concerning Judicial Astronomy. Uh, in other words, the, judge, uh, the astronomy, astronomy and astrology were the same thing, uh, astronomy of judgments. So my starting point for this work was an MPhil by Nick White, as I said, who investigated this manuscript from the point of view of a non-astrologer. Um, but although he looked at it and gave a good overview of the, of the manuscript, he didn't transcribe or translate the manuscript apart from a transcription of the prologue um, and one small section on Aries. So the rest of it was a Latin manuscript that, that was written that nobody's translated yet. So the task I've been working on has been to translate this manuscript um, into English. Now, manuscripts are quite an interesting area of study because it wasn't that Roger sit, that sat down and wrote a book and we've got it today and we can look at it and there's just one copy of it. Manuscripts got copied. So when I first uh, came across uh, the, the manuscripts in Cambridge University Library, I took one look at it and thought, God, how do you read that? I mean, it's, um, it's a bit of a mess. It's a fairly scrappy hand, and it's quite difficult to read. And I thought it's going to take me years to go through that. But what actually happened is this is not in Roger's own hands. This is a 40, uh, 13th century manuscript. Um, texts that were of interest were copied in these monastic schools, and they were copied and copied and copied, and they were distributed. Um, and fortunately, not everybody has such terrible handwriting. So one of the problems with primary sources, that's a close-up of this first manuscript. And as you can see, it's pretty difficult uh, to read. You've got here De Naturis Signorum, so concerning the nature of the signs. But it's quite difficult to read that. Fortunately, I came across another manuscript, also in Cambridge University Library, which is a little bit easier to read. It's still a little bit tricky, but um, it's, much ne it's a much neater hand. It's not nearly as scrawly. And when you've got two manuscripts to look at, if, you, if you, there's a word that you can't work out in one, you might be able to work it out in the other. So that's quite useful. And uh, the introduction, the, the actual, the, the, the very beginning of this manuscript says, uh, starts off there, quoniam regulus artis astronomicae judicandi. Uh, and my rather loose translation of it is, as we discover the rules of the art of judicial astronomy, uh, astronomy only from diverse scattered works. In other words, we know we've got this astrology now. There was a big 12th century translation movement. We got the text, but they're all over the place. We will shortly gather together in one combined supplement the practices of the astrologer mm -hmm. to satisfy that long for request for those to whom an explanation would be necessary. In other words, he's saying, I've, we've got all these astrological techniques. If you dig around enough, you can find them. But I'm teaching students here. Uh, he, he says later on in the introduction that he uh, laboured for many years in the school at Hereford, teaching students. So he's saying, so I've put all these together in a single volume for you. So rather than being a translator, 
he was a collator, he was a teacher, getting all these sources, explaining how things worked, putting them together in a single volume. As I say, when you look at, uh, it's nice having more than one manuscript. Here we've got, I mean, this one here, so the, the one at the Bodleian Library, is a very beautiful hand. It's actually quite easy to read. I mean, look, pre, the S's look a bit like F's, but you can see that says presentem, for example. So it's much easier to read. And if you get stuck on a word in one of them, uh, all three of these, this is exactly the same paragraph in three different manuscripts. So it's nice having all three of them because if you get stuck on a word in one, you can, might be able to work it out in, in another. So, for example, um, we, can sit, we can date manuscripts as well by looking at them. You'll see in this, this one here is actually a, uh, a 13th, so early 13th century, and they're not using numbers. It's in a very neat hand that we can kind of read quite easily, and it's got T apostrophe T I A M, so tertian, third. The later manuscripts, the, the other two, I think, are late 13th century, early 14th century. By now, they've moved on to using numbers. So instead of writing out the word third in full, they're putting three with a, an A after it. Three, third, third. So we can date manuscripts by looking at the writing style. Uh, writing style was very neat in the 12th and 13th century, and it kind of went, got more flowery and more difficult to, to read to our eyes after that. Um, and as I say, it's always very useful having several copies of the manuscripts, but you can, you can work out the provenance from, uh, from that. So what sort of things was he putting in his book? Well, he starts off by going through giving a description of the signs. So uh, the, this picture, by the way, isn't from Roger of Hereford. It's just a generic medieval image. I'm just using that for illustration purposes. It's all text in his book, hardly any diagrams. So when he's talking about a particular sign, here's uh, this one's talking about Capricornus. And so it gives us something about the character of Capricorn. And as astrolog you know, if you're an astrologer, you'll look at some of those keywords and they'll make sense. They're kind of Capricornian. Uh, regions mainly came from Ptolemy. Uh, and the sort of places, forts with gates and water wheels, coasts where ships land, places of dogs, foxes, serpents, and so on. They're a little bit unusual. Remember, Capricorn wasn't a goat in medieval times. It was a, it was a goat fish. Nobody's quite sure what a goat fish is. There is some suggestion it might have been a particular sort of fish that you actually get in Iraq uh, that goes along the Euphrates and the Tigris, um, an edible one. Then you've got body parts by planet, which is quite interesting because you're probably familiar with the idea that Aries is the head, Taurus is the neck, uh, and so on, right down to Pisces as the, as the feet. But he goes into a bit more detail saying, well, if you've got Saturn in Capricorn, then it's the head and feet. If you've got Jupiter in Capricorn, it's to do with the knees and the eyes. And there's this interesting attribution of bodily parts according to a planet in a sign, um, which comes from Alcabisi, in fact. So he's getting that directly from an Arabic source. And then it gives uh, a body description, slender legs, a dry body, a face like a he-goat, and lots of hair. So there we go, that's Capricorn. He then goes on about the planets and again gives characteristics uh, the nature in a person, uh, body parts, appearance, and role. So here's an example for uh, Jupiter. So characteristics, handsome, diurnal, warm, humid, sweet, and so on. Um, laws, temples, festivals, and winds. That's all quite Jupiterian. You think of Jupiter, the, the lawgiver, and the benevolent lawgiver. Uh, the nature in the person, uh, what a Jupiter person is like. Uh, body parts, again, to do with the planet. And then the appearance, uh, red and beautiful robes mixed with white and brown, a beautiful soul, long and beautiful hair, and uh, the role that each planet plays. So he's basically just giving a textbook here of signs and planets, and nothing too unusual from uh, a point of view of anyone that studied any medieval astrology or, or even some modern astrology. So where did he get his ideas from? Well, he got some from Abu Mashar, some from al -Kabisi. There are some techniques that don't seem to be standard Arabic ones. He might have got those from Jewish sources from Ibn Ezra. I'm not, I'm not sure that's something I'm still uh, a loose end that I'm still tying up there. And some seem to be original to Roger, although it would be a bit weird if he was a teacher and he was suddenly making up astrological techniques. So I suspect that he did get them from somewhere. So, for example, here's uh, a, 
uh, one that, oops, here's one that is um, uh, an Indian technique. And it's where you divide a um, sign into nine equal parts. Now, if you look in, in Alcabisi, because this is not a, a Roger technique, it's quite long-winded. He refers to them as the Nalbarat and then goes into great detail about its, uh, uh, its three degrees and a third for each, each little mini thing. And you can kind of work through the Alcabisi and it makes sense. But Roger explains it, I think, a lot more clearly. He, just, he calls them novenes, uh, ninths, and he says, OK, so it's going to be 200 minutes. Uh, where 60 degrees makes a minute, so one node means three and a third degrees. But he gives, um, he basically gives a, a fairly simple way of working out these uh, these nodings, where if we uh, look at Alcabisi, he's got this very long-winded explanation of it. If you're trying to teach a student how to work out where the ninths are, you can start from, say, OK, the beginning of Aries is Aries, and then we go down through the zodiac, you get to the ninth one, which is Sagittarius. So then Taurus, the next sign, starts with Capricorn and so on. Well, you could work your way around the wheel, but you're probably going to miscount somewhere if you're a, a student. So Roger gives a handy tip, uh, a typical teacher's tip, if you like, saying if you want to work out, you know, let's say that you've got a planet at five degrees of um, Taurus, how do you know what novene that's going to be in? Well, Taurus is an Earth sign. What's the cardinal Earth sign? Well, that's Capricorn. So, in fact, the first novene of any Earth sign is always going to be Capricorn. The first novene of any fire sign is always going to be Aries. So it's a little shorthand tip for your students. And then, instead of having to work their way right around the zodiac, they can just say, oh, well, five degrees is about there, so it must be the sign after Capricorn, which is Aquarius. So you can see Roger being a teacher in this book, rather than just a, a translator. He seems to have a few new techniques. He's got one called finding the intention of the question, uh, something about house meanings and planetary hour divisions. So finding the, uh, the intention. Um, Saul mentions this. Now, Saul is, uh, or Zahel, um, was a Jewish astrologer, a Persian Jewish astrologer, working in an Islamic milieu. And he also says it's important to know the intention of the question, but he doesn't go into detail, as far as I can see, not in any of the Zahra books I've, I've seen, of how to do it. But Roger does. He says, look at the nature of the rising sign, look at the rising degree, and the duodenaria, that's just a twelfth of a sign. We've got a, this concept of each sign has a mini zodiac of twelve signs in it, just like we saw with the uh, each sign containing nine um, signs just now. You can also divide a sign into twelve. And he says, if you look at the um, uh, look at the rising degree and the Jordan area that contains the ascending degree, look for the house that's occupied by that sign and the following house, and that will tell you something about the intention of the questioner. It's almost beginning to sound psychological, isn't it? You know, the, um, you've come to me to, uh, to the astrologer to ask a question, but I need to know what's really going on. So. I'm not quite sure what it means. It would be nice if he actually gave some really good worked examples. But does it mean, for example, that if somebody comes to the astrologer asking about, say, his father's health, is he really saying, when am I going to inherit my father's fortune, rather than, is my dad going to get better? That sort of thing. Um, but he gives techniques here for finding out the intention of the question, and that it's important to know the intention of the question. Another one he gives is uh, a second method for finding the intention by looking at the ascendant ruler and, and aspects. So he says the intention is discovered by the lord of the ascendant and by planets that are joined to and their location in the houses and signs. So if the lord of the ascendant is in the 11th house, which is the house of friendship, and that happened to be joined with something in the 7th, which is to do with relationships, uh, the opposite sex, then the intention is to do with the friendship of women. So he, he kind of gives a, an example there, but doesn't go into any more detail. There's also a bit of amazing fine-tuning that goes on, rather than just this textbook stuff of Aries is like this, Jupiter is like that, and so on. He says, so if we've looked at a planet and its nature, and uh, a sign in its nature, and the house in its nature, then we look at the strength of the planet in its place. So he gives an example here, that if the... If in addition to a planet used to signify the question, 
uh, a connection, there's a connection to the fifth house and the lord of the fifth house, the ruler of the fifth house mm -hmm. is Saturn and Saturn happens to be in the sixth house in Taurus, we would consider the sickness of the stomach of the sons. Now this is really specific stuff, isn't it? What he's saying is that the fifth house is to do with kids or sons. Um, the lord of the fifth house is Saturn, and if Saturn's in the sixth house, well, the sixth house is to do with illness. And remember earlier I said that each, uh, as well as Aries being the head, down to Pisces, the feet, we have this idea of a planet in a particular sign means something, and Saturn in Taurus is to do with the stomach, uh, and that's, that's from Alcabesi. So we've got something really um, specific here. You're doing some astrology, and you know that something key is going to be the sickness um, of the stomach of the sun. So, you know, your son has got some kind of illness in the stomach, and, and all of that just from looking at uh, one particular planet and its, its house position. So he does go down to a lot of fine-tuning there. He's also got some interesting techniques for house meanings. Um, the fifth house is traditionally the house of children. Um, but we know that the fifth, um, a lot of the medieval astrologers had um, extra nuances for houses. So you could say, well, not only is the fifth house the house of children, but it's the second house, which is to do with property, from the fourth. And the fourth is associated with father, so your father's property would also be the fifth house. So each house has 12 meanings. But this is one that I haven't seen before. It's a technique I haven't come across, where he divides the fifth house into four. And they're all divided slightly differently. It's not all houses divided into four. Some are divided into two, some are divided into three, some are divided into four. So the fifth, whoops, the fifth house is divided into four. So the first quarter is to do with sons. That's the traditional meaning. The second quarter is to do with clothes, because the fifth house is also the house of um, you know, splashing out and being beautiful and fun and joy and so on. Um, the third house is letters and tidings, and the final one, parchment and books. So not traditional fifth house meanings, but he's dividing the fifth house into that and, to, and giving them four different meanings according to which quarter it's in. The, similarly, the sixth house is traditionally the house of illness and slaves, so he divides the sixth house into two. The first half is the patient and their illness, and the second half is servants and beasts, because uh, servants or slaves and small animals are sixth house traditionally. So how do you know whether the sixth house is to do with illness or whether it's to do with servants and small animals? Well, it depends which half of the, the house it's in. So another curious technique that I haven't found in the Arabic texts or in um, uh, the Jewish ones that I've looked at. So I'm not sure where that comes from yet. Um, planetary hours was another technique that he adds to. The idea of a planetary hour is quite simple. Um, you know that the seven days are ruled by planets, so Sunday is ruled by the sun, moon day by the moon, um, and the other planets, if you speak French rather than English, or Latin rather than English, uh, they all become, become completely obvious. You know, Vendredi is Venus's day, um, so that's, uh, that's Friday. Mardi, uh, Tuesday, is Mars's day. So each day is ruled by a planet, but so are the hours. Um, you divide the daylight into 12 um, equal segments, so it's near the solstice at the moment, so we have about 16 hours of daylight, so you get about an hour, each hour, daylight hour is about an hour and 20 minutes, each nighttime hour is about 40 minutes. Um, and so today, for example, is Friday, that's Venus's day, so at sunrise for an hour and 20 minutes, it was the hour of Venus. Then it moves on in the standard Chaldean order, so that's Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, uh, sun, uh, Venus, Mercury, Moon. So after Venus comes Mercury, so then it would have been the Mercury hour, then it would have been the Moon hour and so on. And that could be used for things like if you're going to go on a journey, it would be good to go on a, a journey when it's the hour of Jupiter rather than the hour of Saturn. You're going to be delayed if you set off in the hour of Saturn. But he goes into more detail than that and he uses the, this weird technique to find the res clausa, the hidden meaning, and I've not seen this before, and I can't make head nor tail of it, to be honest. I mean, I'm going to read this one out in full because it is just so bizarre. If anyone's got any ideas, that would be great. So the Lord of the Hour, so you look at the Lord of the Hour in another way, the intention and the hidden thing can be judged. So the idea is somebody's come to you with a, a question, I've lost something. Um, and, with all, um, and the hour is divided into three. If the missing thing is in the first part of the hour of the sun, you look for oneself or one's associates. And the hidden thing will be concerned with food or herbs. 
If it's in the second, you look for advice concerning war or siege or fortification or panic, and the hidden thing will be bones or land or money. And if it's in the last, you look for uh, advice or debate, evil omens, avoiding the anger of the powerful, and the hidden thing will be white-wooled or white-haired sons or something twisting. Well, you think if you go to an astrologer saying, look, I've lost my sheep or whatever, you know what you've lost. So why would you have to actually find out what the hidden thing is? Presumably you know. So I'm not quite sure what that was all about. It's uh, a little bit bizarre. Some are very bizarre. I mean, um, if it's in the first part of the hour of Saturn, you look for learning and and bearing books, and the hidden thing is glassy green. Uh, If it's in the second, a fighting man or a woman about to give birth. And if it's placed in the day, it'll be masculine, night is feminine, and the hidden thing is iron or another metal or anything accustomed to being put in the fire. If it's in the last, it concerns illness or a friend's illness or war, and the hidden thing is the head of a bat or a bird of two colours. I <laughs> <laughs> don't know, if anyone's got any insights into that, I'd be very interested. I mean, this is just, you know, completely uh, fucked, but do you think the hidden thing could refer to where the missing object might be found? Ah, yeah, that's a good point, isn't it? I wonder how many hidden objects were in heads of bats, though. Well, <laughs> but I that's know, a very I'm good point. <laughs> it's almost a bit picatrixy as if well, you isn't back, it? If you go, go, can you go back? Mm. Do you think Chris, can you just take a moment? Well, if the hidden yeah, thing is the, end, the first hour, one looks for learning and bearing books, the hidden thing is glassy green, so maybe it's... Green cool. Window, yeah. Something like that. No, that's that's or a very a good point. Can I take questions afterwards? Actually, because I've got to wrap up in a couple of minutes. But yeah. Um, so to sum up, then is Roger relevant? Because I might just have found a manuscript written by some slightly wacky teacher in Hereford that nobody ever bothered translating. So what I wanted to look at was um, was his work copied? Over uh, and spread over a wide peri- uh, uh, wide area geographically, and yes, it was. Uh, we can see that where the manuscripts are now, uh, a lot of them are in Cambridge. But we do have the provenance of some of those manuscripts um, from medieval library catalogues, and we can see there were quite a few in York, some in Norwich, Bury St Edmunds, Canterbury, Winchester, Kenilworth. His work was obviously important enough to copy and spread. Um, to those different places. And they also went over a period of centuries. The latest Roger manuscript we have is early 15th century, and he was writing in the 12th century. So people were copying these for 300 years. So they were copying it widely and distributing it widely. So yeah, I think he was um, significant. We don't know for sure whether he traveled to centers of translation or stayed at home, uh, whether he had connections with Jewish scholars in Hereford, which was Nick White's uh, theory. Um, Whether he was a teacher, a senior politician, or a monk, we know that he witnessed the consecration of the Bishop of Hereford, so he was obviously quite important, and not just a teacher in a a monastic school. And we don't even know where he ended his days. He kind of vanishes from the records in um, Hereford, but there is a suggestion that uh, I'm still looking into, that it might be that he ended up moving to Bury St Edmunds, uh, uh, because there was a monastic school there, and this paper from ISIS in 1932 says Roger of Hereford probably ended his days at a monk in Bury St Edmunds. If he did, he certainly lived to a ripe old age because that was uh, about he would have been about 80 by the time he uh, that that last one was was there. So that's really the research I've done so far on on Roger, and um, I've still got a few loose ends to, to tidy up, as you can see. It's so, thank you. It's brilliant. Yeah, thank you very much. It's really coming along. We're starting to get close to Roger. Yeah, Yeah, it's really exciting. While Chris takes questions, um, maybe Francis, you could set up Dorian's, um, get Dorian working on this. That's still recording. Sorry, Chrissy. That's all right. I was just thinking that he might be using a metaphor that they would understand it in this case for things like birds. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You you could well be right because. We we always see things through our modern filters, yeah, yeah. and it might have made it might have been completely obvious at the yeah, time. So